good time just since we are talking about Chairperson Anthony Morales. He is online and participating in the Zoom meeting. And so perhaps we could just get the statement from him in regards oh, to that so that we, yep. Yeah. And so if we could get Chairperson Anthony Morales from the Gabriel Leno San Gabriel Band of Mission Indians online. Yes, this is Anthony. I'm here. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, again, thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to voice my opinion and the concerns of not only myself personally, but of my tribal council, the Gabrielino San Diego Band of Mission Indians. I, I want to start off with just a little bit of the background of, um, of our involvement uh, way back in the early 2000s when uh, uh, the the Playa Vista development was taking place or was ready to be developed. And um, uh, we've been involved there since uh, there again, early 2000s. Uh, I want to start off with uh, just a little bit of uh, background information of uh, of the village that is there at uh, Playa Vista or Bayona Wetlands. It's um, uh, the village of Winnikapar, which means Full of fresh water. It's a it's a nine thousand year old village, and it was um, during the times of the development. Uh, there was a, uh, a a burial ground that was uh, 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 desecrated. There was a thousand human remains, and again, uh, it, it was an, an atrocity for our people. Uh, it's it's something that. Um, it's a it's a site that is uh, registered, and, and again, um, we were involved with input and going to different meetings and city councils and what have you. But as you all know, the project took off and continued a mass destruction and just uh, of a 9,000 year old village and our ancestors. Uh, the during those days, the Native American Heritage Commission sent various letters to the developers and to the city of Los Angeles, where it said that the Bayona Wetlands Ecological Reserve cannot be considered apart from the upstream Playa Vista development. And it went further to state that because of all the destruction, of all the desecration of our ancestors, that this is the greatest destruction of Native American burial sites and cultural resources in recent California history. So with that being said, here we are 20 years later, and again, we're addressing uh, a project that it, they're describing as restoration. For us, I think it's just an alteration, because as I've been hearing, they're talking about drainage ditches and diversions of different uh, uh, water sources, and that's exactly what happened when uh, the development was going on. They were talking about uh, diverting water, a watershed or a stream bed, and um, they ignored our input. That we told them that it was a sacred site, there was cultural resources there, there was human remains there, and they went ahead and ignored us. And it still continued and did not divert the waterway that they were supposed to, and they went ahead and found the thousand human remains there. So with that being said, I, here we are again, uh, as a present day descendant of the Gabrielino tribe, we are again facing a historical trauma. And by this, I mean that it, it is emotional and psychological wounding extending over an individual lifespan and across generations caused by traumatic <clears throat> uh, experiences. And this is exactly that for us and for my and for my tribal members and for any Native American, that this trauma continues. And I feel that this project will continue that trauma. Uh, they're trying to disguise it as a uh, restoration, as I said, but for us is nothing more than an alteration. Um, I heard speakers before me saying uh, about the sediment and so many cubic whatever feet of sediment. Um, 
but what what they fail to say or address is that it is no matter how much sediment or whatever is there through the years, it's still a traditional cultural property. No matter what, it's still that, and it, it and it a traditional cultural property encompasses <clears throat> a cultural landscape. So those elements are still there, and this is why we need to continue protecting those elements, those elements and their fresh water. Uh, I want to read just a, a quick paragraph or two that I submitted uh, the other night uh, uh, to the um, water board. And I'm going to start off by saying that uh, CDFW and the Coastal Conservancy are not listening to our indigenous concerns to protect and preserve the freshwater nature and ecosystems of the Bayona wetlands. Instead, they come to you with the restoration, which is an alteration for us, in which they are asking to allow them to, to the form of trenches, ditches, whatever the definition you want to give it, of draining fresh, sacred water out to sea. Um, in doing so, CDFW and Coastal Conservancy also fail to consider our burial sites that are also draining away, which will happen if this project goes on. And um, uh, it's destructive, and it's going to allow salt water to infiltrate into a freshwater bay and contaminate it. Uh, the environment will be, uh, of the freshwater, of the, of the wetlands will be contaminated. Um, there will be a renewed upheaval of burial sites that have been acknowledged at Bayana but are not being protected and left in place. This is disrespectful behavior needs to end. We want to see the goal of preserving protector, protecting Bayona intact as a freshwater driven ecosystem and to protect its native habitat and wildlife corridors. We want to see the promises that were given to us in the past that, that restoring Bayona is exactly what it'll do and that it will not convert it into a saltwater driven ecosystem. The state claims that it desires to protect rare wetland areas. Bayona is a rare freshwater driven coastal wetland. In Southern California, the state's conversion of its coastal wetlands to full tidal have tipped <clears throat> any balance, causing Bayona to become a rare remaining coastal freshwater driven ecosystem. Although the agencies involved with Bayona came to be mindful and respectful of our indigenous culture, but there has been no evidence of this. Now is our, your chance to show otherwise and help us to protect the sacred site that is Bayona wetland. I sent a, um, a list of questions uh, to Mr. Brody by way of Patricia McPherson, who I've been networking with. And we also sent the very same questions to the Coastal Conservancy. Uh, I heard that um, um, they've been trying to contact me. I did receive a few emails. However, I felt that uh, they were not answering my questions. So for me to continue networking with these agencies where they're ignoring my questions would just be a lost cause. Uh, because for them and for any agency, recording that they had contact with the Native people is just a, a prerequisite for them. It just goes on their record that they did do outreach. And for therefore, I, I felt that uh, until my questions were answered, which they're not, I, I felt that there was no need personally to uh, continue networking with them. So this is why I continue networking with uh, the uh, environmental groups that are out there at, at uh, out there at Biona. And, uh, and this no, is why- Chair, Chairperson, Mor Chairperson Morales, uh, yeah. I, I'm sorry to in interrupt you, but I think that we do have an opportunity now to really have that dialogue between yourself and CDFW and the Coastal Conservancy. I mean, I think everybody is very interested in opening up that dialogue and having that discussion as well, too. Yeah. And so I, I want you to, to stay on the line and uh, and and hold hold your thoughts right there. 
but there, there's just a, a couple of clarifying questions that I have in my mind as well. And um, it, it appears as if the TMDL that was issued by EPA is large, a, a large driver of this restoration pro, uh, project. And so this is a question to staff and to um, um, CDFW. Uh, so as of as the restoration is designed right now, and if it's implemented as is, would it, once constructed and operational, satisfy or be compliant with the TMDL that was issued by EPA? Um, well, I haven't really had a chance to um, study any of the uh, uh, um, the re compliances or, or, or reports. Uh, um, this is something that I would have to evaluate with with my uh, my key tribal members. Um, I, I don't know if whatever oh. they plan to do, whether but, but, this is going to be the answer to all of this. I, I don't know yet. I, I need some more time to evaluate this. Yes, yes. Yes, uh, Chairperson Morales, but, uh, I, I do want uh, our staff to answer that question as well in regards to the TMDL compliance through this restoration project. Yes. I can give you a, an overview and then turn it over to Ashley or LB. Um, the, uh, the TMDL is flexible in the implementation recommendations it has and offers alternative load allocations that could be implemented that as long as the alternative load allocations and the numeric targets are achieved, a re uh, the restoration project would comply with the TMDL. The currently proposed plan does, but the, the, uh, as long as it would, you know, any, any restoration plan could comply with the TMDL as long as it, it met those flexible allocations. Is, am I missing anything, 401 staff? Okay. Okay, thank you. And, and I know that uh, CDFW had also discussed funding. And so I'm wondering um, how is how are these delays affecting the available funding that there is for this restoration project? I would ask CDFW to respond to that question if they can. Yes. Oh, if I just talk, oh, okay, I can, I didn't know I have to wait to see my name up on the screen. Um, same answer, we're still evaluating. I'm sorry, I can't give you a more clear, clear answer on that. 